Chapter Three of The Secret of the Ninth Planet, Version Two by Donald Volheim. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Weiss. Chapter Three, The Secret of A. G. Seventeen. The Dennings did not have much time to speculate on the mystery of the Sun Stealers, for just as they were discussing what should be their next course of action, the problem was solved for them. There was a roaring in the air, then a humming and in a matter of a few more seconds six rocket helicopters popped into sight, hovered over the valley on streaming jets, and settled down. "'They're U.S. planes,' gasped Burl, jumping to his feet and going to meet them. "'It must mean that they know we stopped the machines.' "'Obviously,' said his father, striding with him to greet the helmeted man who was now stepping out of the lead machine. By this time the last of the squad had landed, and the khaki-clad soldiers in them were already disembarking. I imagined that all over the world the sky turned a little brighter. It must have been apparent at once. The leader of the copter men reached them. He was a tall bronzed man wearing the service coveralls and markings of a captain of the Air Force. He stretched out his hand. You must be the Dennings. I'm Captain Saunders. I've been asked to bring you back with me right away so that we can get a complete report on this affair. How fast can you get ready? Why, said Burl, we're ready right now as soon as we can dump our packs aboard. But, gee, you mean go back? Where? Saunders smiled grimly. To California. We just left there. I have been given urgent orders to waste no time. So will you oblige? The two Dennings looked at each other. This was important, all right. They realized that these planes had flown on fast rockets the instant the sky had cleared. Possibly there was still a crisis, one they had not heard of. They did not pause to ask further questions. Mark Denning asked the captain to dispatch one of his copters to the camp beyond the mountains to tell Gonzales to load up and start back for Lima. This order given, the two Dennings climbed into the rocket copter, and Saunders took the controls. With a whoosh, the squat craft lifted on its rockets, its jet-driven fan carried it up, folded, and the rocket engine took over. On upward into the stratosphere they hurtled, across the western hemisphere, across the face of jungle and isthmus, across the barren mountains of Mexico, and in a matter of less than half an hour, settled down in the wide green field of a U.S. Air Force base in Southern California. It was all so swift, so sudden, that to Burl it seemed like a dream. There had been so many days in the field, in the peace and quiet of the high mountains of the Andes. There had been the slow hunting around age-worn ruins, the careful, deliberate sifting of tons of soil and sand for tiny shards. Then this, the urgent message, the trek, the weird building, the strange body-filling shock, and the control over the sun-theft globes, followed by the swift transition over thousands of miles. Here he was in his home country, weeks sooner than he had expected, but not to return to his home and school. No, for he felt that somehow an adventure was beginning that could lead anywhere. Perhaps his adventure had actually ended, but he saw now that he would be questioned, probed, and asked to recount his story over and over. Burl and his father were met at the port by a group of officers and escorted rapidly to a room in a large building. Here there were half a dozen men in civilian clothes. One by one these men were introduced, and as each one was named, Burl wondered more about what was to come. There was a general from Army Intelligence. There was a high member of the State Department. There were three noted astronomers, among them the surprisingly young Russell Clyde and the elderly and famous Dr. Merkman. There was an aircraft manufacturer whose name graced a thousand planes, and an engineer who had contributed to the conquest of the moon. The general, Walton Shrove, asked them to sit down. He was in charge of the affair. It turned out to be a careful questioning of their story. It was not a hounding of questions as in a police quizzing or a baiting from newspaper men eager to get a scoop. Rather, their questions were deliberate and intelligent. They drew out the full account of what Burl and his father had seen in that valley and of what the sun-theft globes appeared to be like in operation. They concentrated deeply on the curious experience which it placed in Burl the charge that enabled him to control the machines. "'Would you mind,' the general asked Burl, "'if we subject you to a series of medical and electronic tests "'to determine whether this charge is still with you?' 
Burl shook his head. I'll go along with anything you say. Very well, the general smiled. We'll make our purposes clear to you afterward, but we want to get this over as soon as we can. Burl left the room in company with three technicians who would come in. They took him to the medical office at the base, and there he was given a complete check. At the electronics lab, electrodes were attached to him, and careful readings were made of the natural electrical resistance of his body and of his apparent physical charge. After an hour of tests, Burl was brought back to the main council room. As he entered, he sensed he had interrupted something important. His father looked at him, and Burl detected in his face a certain curious mingling of pride and parental concern. What, the young man wondered, were they all up to? When he was seated, the company grew silent. The general pursed his lips, looked directly at Burl, and said, I think the time has come to acquaint you with the problem our world is facing. We may ask you to make a very personal decision, and we think you ought to know what may hang on it. He stopped. Every face at the table was grim. Mark Denning, too, was sober, though Burl detected that he also did not quite know what was to come. It is apparent that some race of beings, some species from outer space unknown to us, has begun a process of tapping the power and light of the sun for transmission elsewhere. The station on Earth which you shut down was an important one. But it was not the only one. There are others operating in this solar system. He nodded to Merkman. The old astronomer took the cue. The observatories of the Earth, aided by the lunar observers, have definitely determined that there is still a certain amount of light being shifted from the faces of other planets and diverted. We have detected by telescopic and telethermic measurements that there are areas of sun disturbances on the surfaces of the planets Mercury and Mars. We suspect the existence of one on Venus. We believe that this may prove to be true on other planets as well, but we have no doubt of the first two. Measurements of the amount of sun power being piped away and of the effect of the magnetic disturbances used to create and maintain these stations have shown that they will have a definite effect on the structure of the sun itself. We have not yet completed all our calculations, but preliminary studies indicate that if this type of solar interference is not stopped, it may cause our sun to nova in somewhere between two and three years' time. He stopped, but the thirty-year-old prodigy, Russell Clyde, took up the story. By nova, we mean that the sun will literally explode. It will flame up, burst to many times its present size. Such an explosion will burn Earth to cinders, render all the planets inside the orbit of Jupiter uninhabitable, scorch their atmospheres, dissolve their waters into steam, and make them lifeless flaming deserts. We have seen other stars turn nova. We have measured their explosions. We know just about what age and stability inside a sun is necessary to cause this, and we fear that the danger of our own sun doing so is great if the sun tapping is not stopped. Everyone at the table was silent. Burl was stunned. Finally he caught his breath. But how can we stop it? We can't get to all the planets in time. Our rockets are not ready, and rocket ships would be too slow. Why, it would take two years for rocket ships to reach Mars if the expedition were ready now, and I understand it will be another ten years before Operation Mars is even attempted. General Shrove nodded. That is correct. Our rocket engineering is not yet advanced enough to allow us to take such emergency action. We are still only just over the doorstep of interplanetary flight, and our enemies, whoever they may be, are obviously far advanced. But as you will see, we are not entirely without hope. Colonel Lockhart, will you tell them about Project A.G.? All eyes turned to Lockhart, who was a short, stocky man in civilian clothes. Burl realized that this man had been a colonel at one time, but remembered now that he had taken a post with one of the largest aviation companies after leaving the service. Lockhart turned cold gray eyes directly to Burl. We have in my company's experimental grounds one virtually untested vessel which may be able to make a flight to Mars or any other planet in the time allowed. This is the craft we refer to as AG-17, the seventeenth such experiment and the first to succeed. 
it is powered by an entirely new method of flight, the force of anti-gravity. Burl hung breathlessly on his next words. You probably know that work on the scientific negation of gravity has been going on since the early 1950s. It was known shortly after experiments had been conducted on atomic and subatomic particles that grounds had at last been found by means of which a counteraction to gravity might be set up. Early subatomic studies showed that such a force was not only theoretically possible, but that certain subparticles actually displayed such tendencies. On the basis of these first discoveries, work has been going on in the development of negative gravitational drive for at least twenty years. As early as 1956, there were not less than 14 such projects underway in virtually all the leading aircraft industries of the United States, not to mention the rest of the world. In the last few years, at the direction of the Air Force, these projects have been consolidated, placed under one roof, and brought to its present status, which is, we believe, the one of final triumph. He glanced at General Shrove, who returned the glance unsmilingly. After the successful testing of several models, a full-size craft has been built which utilizes the new method of space drive. One such craft has been built, and only one. This ship, if it works, is at this time the only means by which humanity can hope to make the trips to the other places in the solar system from which the sun-stealers are working. It is with this one vessel only that we can put their sun-tapped stations out of commission." but I emphasize again the experimental nature of this ship. What its capacities are, and how well it will work, is still a matter of planning book conjecture. We can prepare the ship to take off in one week's time. I do not think, judging from what Merkman and Clyde have said, that we can afford to wait any longer. Another such ship cannot be built in less than a year. General Shrove spoke then. It is already arranged that this AG-17 spaceship is going to go. A volunteer crew has been selected. Several of them are in this room. He nodded briefly to Clyde and to Lockhart. But although these volunteers are among the best men in their fields, there isn't one of them who couldn't be replaced by someone equally skilled in the same field. But there is one person on earth right now who may just possibly be unique." This person may hold, by virtue of an experience not shared by any other human being, a special key that will render easier the task that this spaceship must fulfill. He turned to Burl, who sat tingling with suspense. You, Burl Denning, are apparently still carrying some sort of electronic or sub-electronic charge which is attuned to the controls of the sun tap station. We feel that you should be along in this expedition. It will be long and dangerous. It will involve landings on worlds no man has ever visited or expected to visit for hundreds of years. There is an enemy in the sky who will certainly try to stop our single ship. To be bluntly honest, the voyagers on this ship face such dangers as explorers have not faced since the days of Magellan and Cook. Its chances of return are probably remote. But with the permission of your father, which he has already given, I would like to ask that you volunteer to join its crew. Burl felt dizzy, his heart thumping painfully within his chest. He took a deep breath and then carefully, trying to keep his voice from quivering, he said, Yes, I'll go. End of chapter 3 Recording by Tom Weiss TomsAudiobooks.com